So you can read the translation. I'll read the, the you know, the purport, and we'll just take turns, a paragraph at a time, or translation purport, or whatever. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, you can read the translation. This is verse. This is text twenty-three of the sixth chapter, first canto. Uh, by service of the absolute truth, even for a few days, a devotee attains firm and fixed intelligence in me. Consequently, he goes on to become my associate in the transcendental world after giving up the present deplorable material worlds. Yeah, these material worlds are deplorable. <laughs> uh, Prabhupada used to say his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta, he used to say, this is no fit place for a gentleman. You know, <laughs> because there's so many envious people. And, uh, yeah. and uh, it, it's also full of suffering birth death old age and disease which is non-existent it's uh, birth death old age and disease is conspicuous by its absence in the spiritual realm the mm -hmm. spiritual realm actually is three quarters of the entire cosmic manifestation only one quarter is this material universe and that this is a very tiny particular universe the one that we're in it's like mm -hmm. a mustard seed in a bag of mustard seeds and uh so we're very very tiny as big as this universe is all of these universes are just one quarter of the entire creation of God. And most of the living entities, the three quarters of the living entities live in the spiritual world where they are, you know, non-envious and everybody's uh, a devotee of Krishna. That's why right. they're there. But if you wake up in the morning, you see a material body in the mirror. My mentor used to say this. You know you've made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Purport. Serving the absolute truth means rendering service under the absolute personality of God and under the direction of the bona fide spiritual master, who is a transparent medium between the Lord and the neophyte devotee. The neophyte devotee has no ability to approach the absolute personality of God by the strength of his present imperfect material senses. Actually, we were just talking about this in our conversation back and forth on uh, Messenger. You know, yes, we can't were. really understand Krishna by our research or anything like that. And therefore, under the direction of the spiritual master, he is trained in the transcendental service of the Lord. See, that's the only way to approach Krishna is the transcendental loving service. And then when he's pleased, he reveals himself if he wants to. It's his prerogative. Right. And by such training, even for some, some, even for some days, a neophyte devotee gets intelligence in such transcendental servants, for which leads him ultimately to get free from perpetual inhabitation in the material world and to be promoted to the transcendental world to become one of the liberated associates of the Lord in the kingdom of God. What a deal. I don't know why <laughs> nobody takes anything. Up. Everybody's interested in other things. Nobody's, you know, like the eclipse that just happened. Everybody's completely yeah. into it, you know, and, uh, I'm saying, you know, until instead of this like material phenomenon, it only lasts four minutes. And, uh, you know, why not think about you know, if all these things are happening all the time in the material universe? There's lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, and stuff like that. But uh, why not think about how to get the hell out of this material world where you don't have to take birth and die anymore and be subject to all the four? Yeah. Misery? I mean, and I said, you know, Sounds like an idea. To yeah, me. absolutely. I mean, it, it, at well, the very nice. least, at the very least, instead of looking up, maybe look uh, in. Yeah, look, look in, inside yourself. That's what yogis do. They look inside their heart. The, and in the heart is the soul. The soul is called Atma in Sanskrit. And the soul is very tiny. And they, you won't learn this in any school. Uh, but it's one ten thousandth the size of the tip of a hair. And then mm. there's another <clears throat> entity in the heart area who is the paramatma. They compare it to like two birds that are sitting in the tree of the body. You know, uh, they're just bird, bird is a plenary expansion. Whoops. Hold on. My mini speaker went off. Okay, there it goes again. But uh, that other bird is just a friendly bird. And, uh, He's he the individual soul, he knows what's going on in its own body, but the super soul, paramatma, 
is aware of not only what's going on in our bodies, but what's going on in every single living entity's body in the entire universe simultaneously. So that's like Big Brother on steroids. But yeah, he kindly yeah. he kindly accompanies every living entity in their wanderings through many bodies and uh, fulfills all their desires. You know, whatever they want, and they they if they want to go back to God, Ed, they can go back to God. If they want to go to hell, you know, and forget him forever, they'll let them do that too. It's it's independent. You know, he, right. he fulfills everyone's desires since time immemorial. But. Um, He's just like a localized aspect. They call it a plenary expansion of Vishnu in the heart. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just read the next verse. Um, you know, you read the next translation. Okay. Then that supreme authority personified by sound and unseen by eyes, but most wonderful, stopped speaking. Feeling a sense of gratitude, I offered my obeisances to unto him, bowing my head. See, Perla, um, Narada Muni in his former um, birth, this is the last kalpa, the last generation of the universe. He saw Krishna personally in the forest, you know, when he was traveling around. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Krishna appeared to him and then he disappeared. Because, you know, he wasn't exactly ready to go back to Godhead quite yet. You know, he had to be purified. Purport that the personality of Godhead was not seen, but only heard does not make any difference. This personality of Godhead produced the four Vedas by his breathing. You know where the, the origin of the Vedas is? See my hat here? You know, see this symbol on the top here? Mm -hmm. That's Omkar. All the Vedas were produced from that sound vibration of Om. Yes. And uh, the Vedas are by, uh, produced by the Vishnu's, for the Supreme's breathing. And also the universes are produced by his breathing. Ma Vishnu lies down in the causal ocean. And when he inhales, all the uh, when he exhales, all the universes come out of the pores of his body. And when he inhales, they all appear I'll go back into his body. And that's like a the devastation where everything in the universe is. But that's only one breath. Mm. But you know, like this particular universe has Brahma in it. And he lives for 311 trillion years. And that universe is uh, partially and fully uh, destroyed. And that um, every it's partially destroyed every th like 3.4 billion years. That which coincides with most scientific decimations you know mm -hmm. carl sagan noted that who's a famous american scientist he's and uh, i used to study emerson when i was in high school you ever heard mm -hmm. of him yeah and uh, i was a big fan of emerson i used to read him all the time and he didn't buy the whole christian version of the creation theory some dude and and was studying the bible and he he thought to make a chronology of the creation of the universe and so he trace back Jesus's birth back to Adam and Eve and he came up with a figure of like 6,000 years but Emerson didn't buy that yeah because you could take one look at the Grand Canyon you know that wasn't carved out in 6,000 years right took way longer than that so he preferred the Vedic version he read the Vedas and he read the Bhagavad Gita he read this book and he said this book the Srimad Bhagavatam is to be read on one's knees so he was yeah, totally I'll, into it. I'll tell you, I actually, it, it's, it's far out that you, you say that, you know, Vishnu, you know, with his, with his in breath, you know, it, you said the in breath, the out breath, the, the universes are manifest, the in breath, they come back into him. Correct. correct. So yeah. I actually, I had an experience, uh, I was meditating, um, I was doing a guided meditation uh, with uh, by Ram Das. Yana and, yoga. Uh, yeah, and I actually had that exact experience. Hmm. Yeah, you know they they had a yogi once in Nubrandav. We have a yoga place. Did you just check out our yoga uh, yoga shell? I did. I I looked at it, I, but it wasn't. I wasn't. I would. I didn't catch the. Uh, that was just uh, the schedule made like about four or five years ago. 
and uh it's a nice place it overlooks the lake it's beautiful uh because it's got windows all around so it's a really nice place to do you know different programs and yoga and stuff and uh mm -hmm. there was a yogi that was doing a program there and he did the yoga nidra which uh vishnu manifests his sleeping pastime he doesn't really sleep but Yoga Nidra is his his sleeps on the causal ocean and then the universes are created in that form. So the devotees also do the same kind of thing in different yoga um, uh, processes like Dhyana Yoga, Hatha Yoga. There's so many yogas now and a lot of them are just like bogus. You know, you ever yes. heard of Hatha Yoga? Yeah. Some dude just thought that up. In the, in the 70s, they, he probably thought, maybe I'll just make some money and I'll make it unique. So I'll just increase the temperature in the yoga studio to 105 degrees and we'll do a set regimen of sitting postures and breathing exercise and we'll call it hot yoga. Yeah. I've read, you know, I've read probably of the Vedas, I've read probably three months of continuous audio. If you listen to it day or night and night. Like, uh, that's how much I've read, but I've never seen anywhere where it says you're supposed to sit in the middle of the sun in a hot day and surround yourself by campfires or something that do sitting postures. Yeah. So I don't know what people think when they go to that, but maybe they think if I sweat, maybe I'll just like lose some toxins or maybe they think, you know, a lot of these yoga places are just like filled with people who you know, maybe you want to do some exercise and maybe they think, uh, well, I'll sweat and lose weight and then maybe I can get a date. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but getting a date's not the goal of yoga. Right. It's actually yeah. self-realization, but nobody can do it nowadays. <laughs> That's why chanting the Hare Krishna mantra is the best way. It is actually the only way in the Brihadnaradiya Purana in ancient scripture says in this age of Kali, it repeats it three times. It says, Harinam, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kolo, Nastieva, 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 Gatiranita. It repeats it three times for emphasis. Uh, chant the holy name, chant the holy name, chant the holy name of the Lord. There's no other way. There's no other way. There's no other way for self realization in this age other than the chanting of the Maha Mantra or any name of God. It doesn't matter. You can chant Ram's name. You can chant. But it has to be the supreme personality. It can't be any demigod or, you know, because demigods can't offer liberation. They can only offer material benedictions. So mm -hmm. we have to chant Vishnu's name or Krishna's name or Ram's name and uh, or Jesus's name, you know, Allah. He's got so many names. Yes. Anyway, let's go continue on here. <clears throat> you want to read the translation again? Sure. Yeah. Thus, I began chanting the holy name and fame of the Lord by repeated re recitation, ignoring all the formalities of the material world. Such chanting and remembering of the transcendental pastimes of the Lord are benedictory. So doing, I traveled all over the earth, fully satisfied, humble, and unenvious. That's a really good qualification. You know, humility, I just read a book about humility. It's called Humbler Than a Blade of Grass. My name is Shikshasaka, and it's it's Shiksha means instructions, and Astaka means eight. I was named after the incarnation of Godhead, who appeared 500 years ago in West Bengal, India, who spread the holy name of Krishna. It started this Krishna consciousness movement mm -hmm. in India 500 years ago, and now it's the Yuga Dharma. It's the, it's the way to go back to Godhead, uh, and it says that this is kind of like a miniature golden age within this iron age of Kali. Kali is very degraded. You know, it's the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. There's four ages. There's Satya Yuga, uh, Kriti Yuga, uh, Dwarpara Yuga, and or Treta Yuga, Dwarpara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga started 5,000 years ago. And it's only, so it's going to last for another 427,000 years. But within that, from now until the next 10,000 years, everybody can float on the ocean of love of God, which is created by this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. And then after that, everything's going to go downhill. Yeah. Every, like people will be, 
you know, people have less intelligence, they'll be shorter, they'll be less long lived. People at the end of this age will be about four feet tall, will live to be about 23 or 27, and they'll eat their own children. And at that point, Halki, another incarnation of God, it will come and just kill all of the demonic kings who are posing as kings, but are actually just shudras. And he'll start another golden age. Actually, the people that are will be the progenitors of that age are living in a village called Shambhala in India right now. And they will live for another 427,000 years till the time comes and they can start the golden age again. It's amazing, isn't it? It's incredible. These things are not made up. They're And every single incarnation of Godhead is coming on time, just like the Buddha. You know, the Buddha, this, this book was written 5,000 years ago, but mm -hmm. it predicted when the Buddha would appear, what province in India he would appear, what his father's name would be, what his name would be, and uh, everything. Mm -hmm. So they don't they don't make any mistakes. Vyasadeva was an incarnation of literary incarnation of Godhead. So that is the accuracy of this scripture that they can. And so it predicts it predicted Buddha that appeared like, you know, maybe 3000 years ago. And then mm -hmm. for 427,000 years, Kalki will appear riding on a horse and uh, initiate another golden age. People in the golden age live a long time. Their mode of goodness. We only have, of all the four qualities of, of pious qualities that the human beings have, I think there's four of them. There's um, cleanliness, truthfulness, mercy, and uh, cleanliness, truthfulness, mercy, and uh, what's the other one? I can't remember. But anyway, only truthfulness remains. And that's going fast. If you look at our yeah. politics, everybody's lying. I can, I can definitely agree with that <laughs> yeah it, it, they, they're they so accustomed to lying they just lie habitually they're like uh you know like that snl skit they had like uh they were in a, a club called the uh compulsive liars club or something yeah <laughs> but anyway um uh did i I didn't read this yet, did I, this purport? I don't think so, no. Okay. The life of a sincere devotee of the Lord is thus explained in a nutshell by Narada Muni, by his personal example. Such a devotee, after his initiation by the Lord or his the bona fide representative, takes very seriously to chanting the glories of the Lord and traveling all over the world so that others may also hear the glories of the Lord. Such devotees have no desire for material gain. They are conducted with one single desire to go back to Godhead. This awaits them in due course after unquitting the material body. Because they have the highest aim of life, going back to Godhead, they're never envious of anyone, nor are they proud of being eligible to go back to Godhead. Their only business is to chant and remember the holy name, fame, and pastimes of the Lord, and according to their personal capacity, distribute the message for others' welfare without motive of material gain. Go ahead. And so, Brahmana, Vyasadeva, in due course of time, I, who was fully absorbed in thinking of Krishna, and who therefore had no attachments, being completely freed from all material taints, met with death as lightning and illumination occur simultaneously. Report. To be fully absorbed in the thought of Krishna means clearance of material dirt or hankerings. See, that's the beginning of my name, uh, my name is Shikshasaka. Mm. And the first verse that Lord Chaitanya, he's a, that's the only thing he wrote. He only wrote eight verses. All the rest of his disciples back then wrote all the other books. There's like a ton of literature. It was written by his disciples like Rupa Goswami. We're known as Rupa Nugas or followers of Rupa Goswami because he wrote the conclusive um, science of Krishna consciousness for the benefit uh, to establish the, the philosophy of Lord Chaitanya. We say our obeisances every morning to Rupa Goswami. It goes, uh, Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Shtapitam Mena Bhutale Shvayam Rupa Karamayam Dadati Swapadandikam. When will Sri Rupa Goswami, who is established within this material world, the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya, give me shelter under his lotus feet? We pray like that before every class. 
because we're all followers of Rupa Goswami. He knew Lord Chaitanya. And mm -hmm. that is a rare gift. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, very rich man has no hankering for small petty things. And so a devotee of Lord Krishna was guaranteed to pass on to the kingdom of God where life is eternal, fully cognizant, and blissful, as opposed to this material world where, where our bodies are temporary, miserable, and uh, ignorant, naturally mm -hmm. has no hankering for petty material things, which are like dolls or shadows of the reality and are without permanent value. That is a sign of spiritually enriched persons. And in due course of time, when a pure devotee is completely prepared, all of a sudden, the change of body occurs, which is commonly called death. And for the pure devotee, such a change takes place exactly like lightning and illumination falls simultaneously. That is to say, a devotee simultaneously changes his material body and develops a spiritual body by the will of the Supreme, even before death. The pure devotee has no material affection due to his body's being spiritualized like a red hot iron in contact with fire. You know, if you put a red hot iron, if you put an iron into fire, it becomes hot, it becomes red hot, and then whatever it touches turns into fire. Right. So that's the effect of becoming spiritualized or Krishna conscious. Everything you, you know, you uh, become in contact with becomes spiritualized, including your material body. So yeah. that material, that body becomes naturally Whatever you think of at the time of death, you achieve, uh, you know, because it, it's a natural progression. So if you think of the spiritual things and if you think of Krishna, then you go to Krishna. Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, if you worship the demigods, you go to demigods. If you worship ghosts and spirits, you go to such beings. If you worship the ancestors, you go to the ancestors. If you worship me, you go to me. Yep. Text 28. Go ahead. Hold on a second. Let me scroll it up here so you can read it having been awarded a transcendental body befitting an associate of the personality of godhead i quit the body made of five material elements and thus all acquired fruitative results of work karma stopped okay we got 10 minutes left purport Informed by the personality of Godhead that he would be awarded a transcendental body befitting the Lord's association, Narada got his spiritual body as soon as he quit his material body. This transcendental body is freed from material affinity and invested with pre three primary transcendental qualities, namely eternal, eternity, freedom from material modes. There's three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, and every single living entity is controlled by those modes in the material mm -hmm. world. And freedom from the actions of fruitive activities, that's called karma. The material body is always afflicted with the lack of these. Uh, the, the material body is always afflicted with the lack of these three qualities. In other words, the freedom from these things. The devotee's body becomes at once surcharged with the transcendental qualities as soon as he engages in the service of devotional service of the Lord. It acts like the magnetic influence of a touchstone upon iron. The influence of transcendental serv devotional service is like that. Therefore, change of body means stoppage of the reactions of three mo qualitative modes of material nature upon the pure devotee. See, so the modes of material nature, you rise above the modes, Krishna tells Arjuna again and again in the Bhagavad Gita. It's like a lotus leaf. Even though a lotus is within water, it doesn't get wet. It just rolls right off or uh, water off a duck's back, as so to speak, you know. He's not affected by the qualities of this material world. He's transcendental, just like Krishna. There are many instances of this in the revealed scriptures. Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj and many other devotees were able to see the personality of God face to face, apparently in the same body. This means that the quality of a devotee's body changes from material to transcendence. That is the opinion of authorized Goswamis via the authentic literatures. Just talking about Rupa Goswami, that's who he's talking about. In the mm -hmm. Brahma Samhita, it is said that the, the beginning from the Indra Gopa germ, it's a, like a little tiny single-celled germ, up to great Indra, king of heaven, all living beings are subjected to law of karma and are bound to suffer and enjoy the fruit of results of their own work. Only the devotee is exempt from such reactions. 
by the causeless mercy of the supreme authority, the personality of God. It. There's two types of karma. There's a karma and there's v karma. Uh, and no, well, th there are three. A karma means without karma at all. There's mm -hmm. good karma and bad karma, but actually all karma is bad because say if I good do a good deed for you, then I have to come back in my next life for you to pay me back. You right. Know? So it, you want to become free from all karma. And the way to do that <clears throat> is to worship Krishna. Krishna relieves you from all the referred to activities. And if you clap your hands in front of the deities, all the lines in your hands change. Hmm. Because it, you get rid of karma. They become free from karma. Karma is not eternal. There's three, uh, three kinds of... Um, uh categories in the Bhagavad Gita. There's time, karma, living entity, and God. Four, four quality kind four things that are discussed. God, the living entity, and time are all eternal, but karma is not eternal. It's temporary. Mm -hmm. And it can change. You can change by you know, can get out of this material world by rising above the loads of nature and surrendering to Krishna. That's the ultimate goal of the Bhagavad Gita. The conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita is just abandon all varieties of religion you know krishna told arjuna so many different things in the bhagavad gita he said just forget about all that and just surrender to me yeah. save your time <laughs> i just i was just uh saw this this post you ever heard of the onion magazine yes it's funny but uh <laughs> the onion magazine had this this uh satirical article like it's like a news story it said they had a bunch of devotees chanting and then it said Washington, D.C., uh, like they're reporting, the members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness uh, said, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it said they went on to say, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. You know, <laughs> and that's all they do. <laughs> that was the news story. I, I thought that was really good because that's all we do anyway. And that's all there is, is the holy name, really. Yeah, I mean, yep. <laughs> the holy name is Krishna. And so why why would we want anything more than that? You know, when when Lord Chaitanya was cleaning the temple before the Rath Yatra 500 years ago, all the devotees would clean with him and they would be passing by uh, brooms or, or buckets of water to splash on the walls. And they wouldn't communicate with any other thing other than the holy name, Hare Krishna. And then he would pass it, the bucket of water to the next guy. And they mm. would say, Hare Krishna, you know. Right. But that that is, um, <laughs> I thought that was a funny article because that's pretty much what the devotees do. There's yeah. Because be, it's the only way, uh, like I said, the Brihadnardi Purana says it's the only way to try to to get out of this material world or self for self-realization therefore why do anything else just chant you know and 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 like narada muni he travels around the universe and he chants for others benefit so that's all we do we just share the mercy of krishna through his holy name and that's what, what our have you been to the uh, kirtan center on in pittsburgh yeah oh okay good i yep. hope to meet you there sometime yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, the the uh, there's going to be a speaker there tomorrow night. Yes, I will be there. I'm very excited for the speaker. Yeah, yeah. He all these devotees that Shamasundar knows from India, and he's the one that purchased that whole building. He he dropped about nine hundred thousand dollars to purchase the entire building, and uh, he put another six hundred thousand dollars into creating the restaurant with you know, the kitchen in the basement and the the serve out you know buffet style thing in the front of the place and mm -hmm. uh, so he's invested a lot of money but now it's too small because we get so many people there so he's gonna build yeah i mean it, on the i was side. i was really surprised i mean we went from from being upstairs to now we're downstairs and it seems like a bigger space but it seems like more and more people come every week <laughs> yeah i mean that's why he's going to build a temple he's going to build a whole temple he's already got the location he was talking about the 10-year plan they had a big meeting in this church up in the north side he lives in moon mm -hmm. and so he was talking about the plans you know and they're going to build an, a restaurant up there too called govinda's 
this one is kind of like uh, undercover, you know, it's called Spice Delight or something like that. That's what he's mm. going to name. Just to attract people that won't think it's, you know, Govinda is as, like known for being Hare Krishna place, you know. So he wants yeah. to be a little bit on the down low. And then, but he's going to build a Govinda's properly in uh, on the north side uh, and on some land that he purchased there. He's a businessman. Oh. It's That's really awesome. exciting. This this whole organization, ISKCON Pittsburgh, is really expanding like crazy. Yeah. It's a pretty exciting time this this summer, and uh, I'm just looking forward to it so much, you know, because it's really growing. It's bursting at the seams, so to speak, you know. We had a little right. apartment. Now, now the whole storefront is is too small. Right. And I mean, that's the whole thing about it. There's two huge things about about the 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 ISKCON. And I mean, honestly, Hinduism in general, from what I've experienced, is A, it's not so exclusive that you can take what you take from from these these teachings and still have the relationship with, you know, who what your uh what you grew up with or whatever, you know, whatever your metaphor you're comfortable with. And it's so, it's so much more universal than, than, you know, and it's not, because a, it's, it's not, really, it's a science of who we are. It's called Dharma. It's Sanatana yeah. Dharma is the universal religion, which is a Dharma means something that's intrinsic within a, a quality of, of a human being. Like the Dharma of fire is white and heat and the Dharma of water is wet. So the mm -hmm. Dharma of, a human being is service. And so everybody's serving somebody like that Bob Dylan song. You got to serve somebody. Right. But we only got less than a minute left. I want to thank you for joining us. Do you have any quick question? Um, no, no. Can't wait for the next okay, one. Well, we got, we got, uh, uh, we got through seven verses, 23 through 30. So that's pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, I, I would look forward to seeing you next time or whenever you can, uh, can jump on, you know, I've always yeah, had somebody, Krishna always sends somebody, my next door neighbor comes, sometimes comes on, you know, but thank you for so much. It was nice to meet you and uh, we'll, nice we'll meet, you meet you again in person one of these days. Absolutely. Yeah. Like we say in New Vrindavan, we don't see in the future. I'll see you in the pasture because it's a farm, you know.